What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here at GSD Studios. First off, thank you so much for checking out today's content. I'll make this extremely fast, but I need to plug our sponsors that make this show possible. Our first sponsor is PerfectStormNow.com, by far the most effective and affordable real estate agent website and database platform in the industry. It is the system I use to sell 50 plus homes every single month. Check it out at www.perfectstormnow.com. Our second sponsor is my personal real estate agent mentorship program, www.90daymastery.com. All right, you guys, let's dive on into today's content. All right, what is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode interview. Every single week, we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top amazing people uh, um, that are that are top of their space that are choosing to go out there and create amazing epic lives for themselves, for their families, as well as have a big impact on others while they exist. So today, guys, we got a very special guest on the show. I'm really excited uh, um, to have on the show. I mean, this guy's uh, done so much and, and uh, created so much success in his life and in his business and every aspect of his life, right? So our guest today, you guys, is an inventor, entrepreneur. He's actually the longest serving CEO. CEO of a publicly traded company in Silicon Valley, um, which, and this, this is just unreal, right? So he's led his company profitably through eight major downturns. And, and those of you that are watching this, um, you know, I know we've got, uh, got a lot of millennials that watch this and kind of, I mean, not kind of, I mean, we, we experienced one in 2005, or not 2005, 2008, 2009, and you, you, you knew you can you know how hard that was to, to go through and, and just survive, you know, and just imagine being able to uh, um, continual, uh, continually create uh, profitable companies um, and lead his company profitably, sorry, through eight of those. So I'm um, also best-selling author um, and uh, just really excited to have Ray in on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Well, thank you, Josh. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, no, I'm excited to have you on. So, um, you know, I'm I'm always because I mean, you got so much. I mean, you're 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 you wrote a book recently. You still got a lot going on. I mean, you're you're, you're uh, Troy told me that you you told him that you could still do one arm push ups and <laughs> so so you got you got. I mean, you still you see, man. Um, but before we jump into all of that, um, I'm always really intrigued from our, our what, like what led our, our, for our guest journeys that led them into entrepreneurship in the first place. So if you, when you rewind those clocks, like what led you into the entrepreneurship world in the first place? Well, it was, I had an aha moment. This is going to date me a little bit back in 71, 1971. That's probably before you were born, Josh. Um, I uh, went to Singapore uh, on a business trip and I went to a place called change alley and um uh, my boss had just called me because of the time difference between California and, and Singapore. He called me at two o'clock in the morning. I said, you know, I don't need this, you know. And so I was looking at this place called Change Alley. And all these people had these little ki- kiosks on the street. They were earning a living. And I said, these guys don't have anybody, you know, paying their way in life. I mean, what's, what's, what's going on with me? How come I'm having to sit here and, 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 and take a two o'clock in the morning phone call? You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. So that was kind of an aha moment for me. And then in 1976, what, five years later, uh, my, my boss, uh, uh, you know, had me come down to L.A. I'm, I'm from the Bay Area. He had me fly down to Los Angeles where the company office is. And he just said, you know, you don't fit in. You're not, you're not the kind of guy that fits into a corporate culture. And I kind of knew that back in 71 when I was a little upset with that 2 o'clock in the morning phone call. And, and so he said, why don't you just go off and, and do your own thing? I, you, you don't really – you know, fit in, you know, you don't fit into the corporate culture. And so uh, I went home and this is middle of uh, 76 and told my wife, I'm not going to work for anybody ever again. And she said, well, okay, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I'll figure it out. So since about June or July of 1976, no one has ever, no one has signed my paycheck. I've, I've signed my own paycheck since so that's what 40 something years, 40, 41 years. Um, uh, I've been signing my own paycheck. And so uh, that, that's what kind of led me. My personality is such that, that you know, I'm, I'm thinking outside the box. You know, when you, when you think about uh, developing something new, unique, you got to go from the known, which is the box. You know, that's inside the box. 
you got to go from the known to the unknown, which is outside the box. And then you got to go further than that because anything worthwhile developing takes time. And, uh, and so, you know, if you, your horizon's got to be five to 10 years out. If you really want to see ahead of where everything's going now, you know, if you're not capable of that, if you have to have all these knowns you're working with, like you're risk averse as you would, then, then don't be an entrepreneur. I mean, entrepreneurs have to be thinking ahead of everybody. They're, they're really the, you know, the, the, the engine that drives our economy is those guys that are out there thinking way outside the box. And that's, and that was me. And, and my poor company that I was with, um, I developed this piece of equipment, which is unique and is probably the most ubiquitous piece of equipment in our industry, but it took 11 years for it to be adopted. And so, you know, my, my back in those days, you know, my boss said, you know, we, we can't afford you, you know, you know, you're thinking too far out. And, and so that's what kind of led me to kind of go off and do, do my own thing. So from, you know, 1971 to 1976, because you, 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 you kind of had that realization five years prior before, you know, before um, actually making that leap. What was kind of happening in those five years? I mean, were you at that point, did you know that this, this, the job corporate world was just a means to an end and we kind of, were you kind of preparing yourself and kind of looking for ideas or like, what was, I'm just really curious of what was happening with you, like internally in those five years? Well, at, at that time, um, I was figure out what I do. I'd gotten my master's in 68 and in and, and business. And I thought, well, you know, this is kind of where I can develop my, my, my personal career uh, around a business. And, uh, and so in the interim, in that 71 to 76 time frame, yeah, I was looking, I was thinking about, you know, where should I go? Where should I take myself? But I was pretty young and, and I had a family and I was worried about, you know, taking care of them. And so, you know, when I was kind of pushed out the door, as you would, uh, in 1976, you know, that, that's, well, I just did a podcast on that, as a matter of fact, called Quit to Succeed. So, yeah. <laughs> so you know, it, I was forced to quit. And, and I'll tell you something interesting. In, in my experience, in my, you know, what are the close to 60 years of experience now um, in working, maybe not that much, 58 years in working, um, uh, I've learned one thing. If you make the decision to leave on your own, usually it's not a very good decision. But if you're forced to leave, Usually, this, your decision that, that you make going forward is, is a good one, uh, because when you leave on your own, you, you're you're selfish. In other words, you're thinking about okay, I'm going to get more money, I'm going to have a better this or that, you know. Uh, but if you're forced to leave, then you know you have no choice. You have to kind of dig your way out. It's kind of like being pushed into it. And so um, that's I as I said, I did this podcast called Quit to Succeed. And, and uh, I was forced to quit, uh, and, uh, and that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yep. So, all right. so, so you were forced to quit. Um, your back's against the, against the wall. It's kind of like you, you've got a family, you've got a support. It's like you've got to it's, – it's make or break time. Um, I mean, you know, because, I mean, the, the statistics, I mean, you, you've got, what, 80% of businesses that fell in the first year – or first five years, and then year six to ten, another 80% of those that made it fail. Um, what was that journey like? To, to get into your first, your, your, your successful entrepreneurship journey from that, that moment of being forced to quit? Well, okay, so um, I didn't form my Krell until 1978, yeah, actually the end of 78. Uh, and so in the interim, I was just trying to figure out what kind of business I, I, I should get into. I tried four other, four other different kinds of companies. Um, and uh, before I hit the gold you know, the, the, the gold ring, as you would, uh, and that was my Krell. Uh, and so while the other ones weren't bad, they just weren't good enough. Uh, but I did try four other uh, uh, startups uh, before I, um, I did my final one. I did the Microcell Razor, which is a, which is a chronograph wristwatch. Um, uh, that was for, you know, for marathoners. In fact, I'm, you can find me in, the, in uh, Jim Fix's second book of running, um, uh, I'm actually listed in there by Jim Fix, who was one of the well-known marathoners at the time. Uh, and then Casio knocked me out because they kept dropping the price on that watch. So then I went to a, into a, a, a kind of a, a distributing business where I was distributing consumer electronics. Now it did okay, but it wasn't, uh, you know, it, it wasn't really a gold 
the golden ring. It wasn't, wasn't something I really enjoyed. It wasn't, I didn't, couldn't get my arms around it. It was doing well. It's just that I couldn't get excited about it. Um, uh, and then there was one in, other in between, which didn't go anywhere at all. And then my Krell's my fourth one. And that was in November of 78. So, uh, so I stumbled along the way. In other words, I tried different things. So if you're going to be in business, you have to be able to, to be self-sustaining for a couple of years. Um, and, and rather than, than having somebody hand you, you know, a lot of money to live on, uh, if you're going to be your own, your own engine, your own, um, uh, uh, VC as you would, uh, you gotta be able to, to, to live for, for a couple of years without a salary. Yep. 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 Love it, man. Well, yeah. And, and it's so, I mean, at that time from that 71 time when you had that realization of 76, I mean, at that point, I mean, cause it sounds like consciously you kind of knew that that was going to be the, the eventual path at some point. I mean, is that, did you start, is that when you really started, Hey, I've, I've got to prepare for this. We got to start budgeting for this, preparing for this and, and stocking away that capital. Exactly. I, I, I invested well in real estate. That's one of your, your uh, loves is real estate. So I, I, I invested heavily in real estate in that time frame, and I did really well. That, that allowed me to, 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 to um, sock away some money. And, uh, and, and so I was able to then, you know, launch myself. I mean, if you don't, if you don't have a little nest egg that you can rely on, you, you know, you're not, you really shouldn't start a business unless of course you're going to have some angel investor or some VC that's going to come in and, and keep you alive. So, you know, you, you really have to have the, the financial wherewithal to, to be able to launch your own business. And, and, uh, and one of the, the uh, criteria I have, uh, in fact, it's written in my book is, is that you should have uh, at least enough money to take you to profitability or at least to, to break even. If, if, if you don't have that to start with, don't even try to, um, to start a company because of, of that 80% that, that, that fail, you know, over half of those fail because they, they just didn't have enough money. They ran out of cash. So, you know, if you want to increase your, your success ratio, you got to have enough cash to, to, to get you to, to at least break even. Yep. Yeah. No, I, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, with entrepreneurs, because we're, we're such optimistic people, you know, because when you get into business for yourself, you have to be an optimistic, optimistic person. And, and when, you know, entrepreneurs are business planning, you know, they, they have these overly optimistic, typically projections and when they're going to reach that profitably standpoint. And, you know, um, when you were, when you were budgeting for that and, and, and doing that, I mean, or, or any advice that you would have for somebody that's, cause you know, we got a lot of uh, listeners that are in the corporate world that, that know that want to be an entrepreneurship and they're here to get advice to be able to make that leap. Um, you know, do you, do you build any kind of, um, threshold into that? I mean, what kind of advice would you give with that? Um, so they're not overly optimistically budgeting and then they run out of that capital as you've talked about. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, you want to have enough money to, to, to start your company, to take it to profitability or break even. If you don't have that, don't even, don't even try it. I mean, you just, cause your chances of, of failure are too high, you know, nine out of 10 will fail because of that. So make sure you have that ability. And then as you, as you run your company, you gotta be frugal. You don't want to increase your, your expenses beyond your, your, the money you're taking in, because that's a sure way to, to, again, to, to go out of, to go out of business. If you're gazout, gazoutus are greater than your gazentus, as they say. Um, and, and, uh, uh, so what I did is I went to the bank and I, I tried VC, the VC route and that didn't work. Uh, because they wanted to own the business. And of course, that didn't suit me. So I went to the bank. And, and, and in order to, to borrow money from the bank, you have to be profitable. And so my company, my Krell, was profitable from day one. Uh, and you say, well, how do you do that? I mean, how can you possibly be profitable? That's the way you organize your business. I changed my business plan because to be profitable, I had to, I had to restructure the, the plan that I had because the bank wouldn't loan me the money if I, was gonna, if I showed I was going to lose money. So um, I developed a, a, um, a business plan that said that I could make money from the get-go. Now, they allowed me one quarter of, of losses for the whole year, um, as long as for the whole, the whole year wasn't, wasn't a loss. So uh, the, the advantage I had was is that um, the, I got a bank loan, a, a decent one. Um, uh, I put up 300000 The bank put up 300000 So they gave me 600000 to work with. Uh, and so I was able to, to launch my, my company. Uh, in 1985, the bank came to me and says, well, 
we're no longer going to require your personal guarantee. And I and they said, how do you like that? And I says, I don't know if I like that because having that that gun to my head, that having to to be, be profitable, I can tell my people, hey, if I'm not profitable, we're going to go out of business, or they're going to they're going to come after me and sell my house and everything else, my, you know, my family, and I'm I'm an, I can't do that. So it gave me something to go to my employees and tell them, you know, you got to help me make this thing profitable uh, because I'm having this gun to my head, this this personal guarantee, and and so. Uh, uh, but the bank said, well, but it costs us money to, for, for us to carry that guarantee unless you really, really have to have it. So a few weeks later, I finally called him back and said, okay, I'll, I'll get off the guarantee. But the bank wouldn't, I mean, they, they almost forward themselves with saying, I can't believe this guy what did, didn't want to get off that guarantee because I, I wanted that gun to my head to make sure that I was going to be profitable. Yeah, love it. So, so with okay, so so you started Micro in, in 1978 um, and uh, became profitable right away. And then, you know, there, I mean, there's a, a lot of businesses that are decently profitable. But, I mean, you take it from just starting out profitable to being, you know, this massive publicly traded company. Um, kind of walk us through, you know, if you will. Um, I mean, how does it even happen, right? Because, I mean, you've got a great product, but then, I mean, to get to the success that you've had, um, I mean, it's, there's so much more than just that. I mean, you're, you're, you're managing massive teams and everything that goes into it. I mean, how, how, do, you, how, how do you go from, you know, 1978 to, to what you've done? Okay, so uh, I had to restructure my company so that I was a, a service company. So I get paid, you know, on a monthly basis. So we sold our services, as you would, um, and or rented ourselves out, um, and, and that's how we got started. Then as I developed more and more um, uh, uh, financial wherewithal, that allowed me to develop some products. And so in 78, I mean, excuse me, in, uh, in 88, I developed a line of products, and then those products that we were able to launch uh, into a portfolio of products, and then ultimately we had over 5,000 products and 15,000 customers. Um, but, you know, if if I were to, to to do it with VCs, VC money, I would I would have they would have made me lose money as you would or or, or made me spend it, uh, uh, and and so for the first five or six years, I would have been at a loss. Um, but I didn't do that route. I took a little longer. So some companies that were similar to mine, like Maxim and LTC, which started the same time I did, started with twenty million dollars. I started with six hundred thousand or three hundred thousand of my own capital. Uh, so they, they went public about five or six years before I did because, you know, I, I had to grow slower. I grew one brick at a time, as they say. Um, but then I ended up owning the company as opposed to the, the VCs owning it. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the, the way I did it, uh, Josh. Yeah. So, you know, I was, I would, last week I was actually at, um, um, an event with Darren Hardy and I don't know if you know, uh, Darren, um, but he was, he just stepped down. Um, but for the last decade, he was the publisher of success magazine. And, um, you know, he had mentioned that, um, most companies uh, outside of lack of capitalization, the, the, I guess the second main reason that they fail is because of growing pains, right? Because of that growing too fast and you were able to grow it brick by brick. Um, with, with doing that in your experience of seeing all these other companies and so many come and go, um, I mean, would you agree with that statement? Um, well, you can grow too fast, you know, and, and just, you know, I call it the asparagus phenomenon. I don't know if you're familiar with, it, with how fast asparagus grows, but asparagus has no food value at all. Um, it, it, it grows so fast, it grows 10 inches in a night. Uh, in fact, they cut it every night during during the early hours so that the the, the, the asparagus is, is fresh. Uh, but it has no food value because it grows so it grows too fast. And and so I liken that to companies that that what I call asparagus companies, which grow too quickly. They have no value. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but you know companies like uh, Facebook and and and. Uh, uh, Twitter and, and uh, Uber and Uber, I guess, and, and companies like don't even make money. They, they, they don't make money at all. Uh, they, they actually lose money. So they have to keep going out and raising money in order to stay alive. Um, you know, uh, Amazon has, has only been profitable for one quarter of the last 20 years. Uh, and, and that's just not a sustainable business. So you want to structure your business so that you are sustainable. To me, a defunct company is a company that can't live on its own. 
It's like, it reminds me of raising a baby. You know, a baby can't live on its own until it gets to the point where it can fend for itself. Usually at, at, at least at 14 or 15 years of age before a, a, a child could maybe go out and, get, and earn a living and, and provide for themselves. We recommend, of course, older, but I mean, you technically, I guess you could go off and, and earn money at, at, at 15 or 16. But, you know, you're, you're, until then, you're really, you're really at, at the mercy of your parents. You know, they have to raise you and pro provide for you. So if you're in a company and you're having to live off of somebody else, then you're not really a sustainable company. And so that my recommendation is, is to develop a sustainable business, which means you have to be profitable. And if you grow too fast, you're not going to be profitable. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. So, um, you know, I mean, you've been through eight downturns, you know, uh, um, which is, and not just through eight downturns, um, you were profitable through every single one of those downturns. Um, yeah, and, 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 you know, in order to do that, I mean, you, you got, and I, I know you talked about earlier, here's the box. You got to think outside the box and you got to think way beyond the outside of the box. And I mean, your ability to be able to pull out a blank sheet of piece of paper and have to reinvent yourself and adapt and shift. And, um, you know, cause it seems like now today, um, with, with the deindustrialization of the economy that we're seeing and th things that are happening, it's like things are just moving and shifting and with this, you know, exponential te technology growth. Um, I mean, how do you as an entrepreneur be able to make those adaptations and shifts the way that you have, um, especially through eight downturns? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if I know of anybody that's really done that or, or you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's amazing. Well, it is. It's, okay, so um, what, what you have to do is you have to be a, an economist in mind. You know, you have to be able to, to think ahead of where the economy is going. And so I was able to, to literally forecast each of the downturns and prepare for it. Um, and so it's, it's really a, a knowing and understanding your market, understanding what, you, how, what percentage of your market is controlled by the economy itself, and then be able to, uh, to, to foresee that. And being able to foresee the downturn allows you to prepare for it. It's kind of like earthquake uh, protection. You know, if you had some seismic way to, to forecast an earthquake coming, you could, you could get prepared for it. And, and I liken that to running a company is you have to have some sensors out there that help you detect the, uh, you know, the downturn and allow you then to, to make adjustments to, to, uh, to weather the storm, as they say. Yeah. So when, when you're, when you're doing that though, um, you know, cause I, I, I'm sure there, there's a point where you, your company got big enough where you could, I don't want to say that was your, your, a big part of your main focus, you know, but in the, in those beginning stages, um, you know, cause with entrepreneurs, we get so, you know, we're trying to work on the business, but we get so busy working in the business and then we can kind of lose sight of, you know, being that economist. I mean, you know, how, how, how did you balance your, and I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that word balance cause I, I know it doesn't always exist in entrepreneurship, but how, how do you balance running the business, being in the business, um, as well as being able to see the writing on the wall? Well, it's all part of it. You know, if you don't see the writing on the wall, you don't know, you're not going to see the upturn either and be able to, to, to accommodate that, that growth. So it's not just looking at the downturn. You also want to look at the upturn uh, and, and know when the, that the economy will, will, um, will, will turn, turn around. So, for example, uh, it, when we call it dot-com implosion, uh, if, you're, if you remember that at all, Josh, um, uh, that happened in uh, – uh, beginning in September of, of, two, of 1999, uh, and then it really, you know, took hold in, in middle to end of 2001. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, what I, I did is I was able to see that downturn coming in, in May, yeah, May of 1999. I actually saw that downturn, uh, which was going to take place toward the end of 1999 going into 2000. Uh, and that really saved our butter, um, as you would, or saved our milk, uh, because we were able to, to, to get ahead of the curve and make adjustments for it. And, and so it, it's being able to know that thing, and not, not by the way, not just the macro economy, but the micro economy, your own, your own business, like in real estate, to know, you know, when, uh, you know, to get in, to get out. Uh, is a, that song that, you know, know when to hold them and when to fold them, you know, you, you got to know, you, you got to be able to look ahead and, 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 and determine, you know, wh which direction you want to, you want to move your, 
your company, whether you want to, you know, take advantage of an upswing or whether you want to, you know, prepare for a, for a downturn. And, and so it's, it's very critical that if for all entrepreneurs that they understand their business, they understand their markets, they understand their competition so that they can stay ahead of the game, both in terms of upside as well as downside. Yep. Yep. Love it. So then um, when it comes to that, um, you know, because I mean, you, you you hear you you hear things like uh, you know, like Warren Buffett um, uh, read six hours a day, you know, right, and, and self develop at such a deep level. And yeah, you know, I love I love the 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 interview where where he was asked about that by Eric Thomas, and and um, um, he's like, "There's only Eric Thomas, like, there's only twenty four hours a day. How do you read six hours a day?" And he's like, "Well, that's that's what allowed me to buy Coca Cola, right?" And and just stressing that importance on that that habitual routine, and you know. Um, uh, what was that like, you know, for you going through that of, um, you know, being able to study in that self-development so you could, you could know your competition, know all of these trends? Well, that's, that's the heart of being an entrepreneur. Um, if, if you're just going to have an easy life, you want to just sit back and enjoy, um, you know, your, your family, your hobbies or whatever, uh, you know, don't be an entrepreneur uh, because it, you know, you're, you're an entrepreneur 24 seven and uh, you, you, not that you should give up sleep or, or give up your family, but you really need to understand your business. Uh, you know, you're in real estate and you have to understand it. If you don't understand real estate, don't get into it because you're just going to lose. Now, you know, I was a big student of my, of my industry and also um, uh, of, the, of the impact on the market of, of our products in general. That allowed me then to move into the right products and also to move out of the wrong products at the right time. Uh, and so, you know, uh, uh, if anybody should understand that, it should be those people who, who are real estate agents and understand how volatile that market is. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have to be able to, to, to save up for the, for the bad times and, and, and you know, stop, sock away some capital and, and be able to survive when things turn south. That gives you then the horsepower when it, things turn back around. You can get good deals and, and possibly uh, – uh, you know, uh, advance your career, uh, speaking now of real estate by being able to buy right when the, when the market's down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm like, like you said, you know, when you, when you, you know, cause people will say, you know, just using real estate as an example, people sit there sometimes in, like in Phoenix, Arizona, right. Um, cause well, and this is really everywhere, but, um, you know, I'll hear this, this comment saying that all oh, the, the markets seem to turn on a dime. You know, but it doesn't seem like really anything does turn on a dime if you're paying attention. I mean, you can see inventory rates. You can, if you're exactly. just, just watching, you can pay attention. You can see it six months or, or a year ahead and, and, and prep it, but you got to pay attention. Exactly. So I'm glad you brought up inventory because that's the way I predicted the downturn in, in, uh, in 1999 on, on the Y2K or the, or the dot com implosion was because I looked at the inventories. The inventories were building. And I thought, holy mackerel, my customers are now carrying 30% inventory. That's crazy. I mean, that typically it's 12%. And now they're up to 30. This is, this is, this is, no, this is a no-brainer. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's when I started cutting back production uh, because I could see that, that I was going to get stuck with a lot of inventory because my customers were building more. And the same thing you're talking about in real estate, you know, if you start seeing the inventory grow, uh, then you, you back off. I mean, you know, that's, that's a bad sign because if you're stuck with a lot of, pro, a lot of product, uh, as the inventory grows, you're done because you're going to have to cut prices just to, just to move it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's an, and I don't know if you've read the, the book, um, by Andy Grove, the, the, the CEO of Intel, only the, only the paranoid survive, you know, and, and with the inflection points and, um, you know, with all of that and, you know, when, when, you, when you, when I was reading that book, you know, cause so many people talk about the, you know, oh, you shouldn't worry so much or the negative you know, impacts of worry, but it's like, you know, to be able to adapt and shift the way that you are. And when you got uh, other businesses always trying to put you out of business and, and other technology trying to put you out of business, it's, it's like, you've got to be that way. Exactly. Well, I, I, you know, Andy, uh, I knew him, Andy, it was a very paranoid person. And uh, he was always looking around the corner saying when, when, when was it going to be the next uh, downturn? Um, and, and so I do believe that you want to be somewhat paranoid, but not to the point where you become a pessimist. Yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, an entrepreneur has to be 
uh, both an optimist and a little paranoid. Uh, because if you're not watching, if you're not looking around, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, going into the war zone in Syria or in Afghanistan and, and, and not having a helmet on or not, not having the proper protection gear, you're just going to get killed. Uh, and, and so, you know, you want to be optimistic at the same time, you want to, you want to be looking around the corner and see what's going to happen. So it's very important, you know, to know your business to, if you don't know your business, of course you have no business being in it. So, you know, you got to know your business. You got to, you got to know when to hold them, when to fold them and, and be a little paranoid. Yeah. Now, have you found value um, or is this something that, that, you know, maybe you did or didn't do um, to, to create all the success that you've had of, um, you know, doing a lot of due diligence in outside industries that, that weren't of your own, just to, just to study those trends and kind of use some of those trends um, and bring those back to your, your industry? Or, or are, you, are you more on the, hey, I'm just going to stay so focused and mastering my space? No, I mean, I... I, no, it's not true. I mean, I, I looked at all, all the industries that I serve, I, that I provide a product for, automotive, industrial, um, uh, uh, the um, telecom, datacom, you know, I, I watched all those industries because that gives me, gave me an idea of, of how my customers were doing. And if my customers were doing well, then I felt comfortable. If my customers were having trouble, then I knew I was going to have trouble ultimately. And, and so, you know, you, you, you want to you study the, uh, the industries that impact your particular business. Yeah, yeah love it. So um, with, um, you know, because, you know, you talked about, uh, uh, you know, your, your marathon running and, and, and I know that you're, you're still, um, you know, one of these guys that just takes amazing, amazing care of your health. How important do you feel, because I'm, I'm a health buff myself, you know, right? So, I mean, how important do you feel um, taking care of your health and, and being in great shape um, has played in the overall success? Well, I mean, it's, 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 I would say it's probably 80 or 90% of it. Um, you know, if you're not healthy, you're, you're not productive. Uh, and so staying healthy is, is, is the heart of, of being ha- able to have a long career. Um, I have a friend who's dying of cancer. He's only got two more weeks to live and his family's panicked now because, you know, it was, they only learned in November he was, he was going to, he was going to uh, die of cancer and they just weren't ready. Uh, and, and so how, you know, how do you prepare for that? How do you prepare yourself for, or your family for, for that uh, s- sort of eventuality? Cause that could happen. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and you just have to, you, you just have to, you know, afford the uh, the time and ability to to be able to 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 last a, a physical downturn whether it be you know a major one like my friend who has cancer or 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 whether it's a carpal tunnel re, uh, re- repair but if you're not healthy josh you're you're not going to do well in running a company yeah yeah love it couldn't agree more so um you know i'm really interested in um um, your, how you identify what your process is to identify what you need to focus on, you know, right. Cause I mean, at all these different stages that you've went through to, I mean, I can't even fathom 15,000 different clients, you know, right. With you got all these employees, you got all this going on. How do you identify? Cause you got, you, I'm sure that you're pulled in a thousand different directions all the time. How do you identify what's essential that you need to stay focused on? And then how do you stay focused on those to ensure that you're not getting pulled away? Well, what, you, what you have to do is, is of course, you, you, uh, you have to know your financials. In other words, if you can't read a financial, you know, it's like a doctor who can't uh, read an x-ray or read a, you know, some kind of a, a medical chart. So, you, you know, you, 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 have to, you have to be able to read financials. Uh, and you've got to know them inside and out. You know, there's, there, there's two parts to a financial, the income statement and the balance sheet. And you've got to know how they work together. You understand cash flow. Uh, and, and, you know, if you don't understand that, I mean, you can understand how to build a, a house maybe, or you may understand how to, to, to uh, c- construct a, a car or whatever. But if you can't read the financials, if you can't read those medical charts, as they say, then you're just not going to succeed. Uh, and so, you know, you, you, to be a good a doctor, you've got to be able to read those medical charts. And to be a good businessman, you've got to be able to read those financials. You've got to understand exactly how the two components, the, the balance sheet and the income statement, work together. That's extremely important because, you know, every um, 
business has its own financial structure that it has to that it has to monitor. Just like every illness has a particular you know indicator that you have to be able to to um, uh, understand before you can give the, your patient the, the right uh, you know prognosis as to how to to recover. So uh, again, you know you gotta you gotta know your you gotta understand financials. Yeah. And when when it comes to you, you know, so we're we're talking about financials, and then you know, there's there's a lot of different matrix and key indicators that that we can focus on. Um, but sometimes it can just be like, whoa! I mean, it, it could just be, you know, it, it can get to the point where I mean, I find myself sometimes doing this. Next thing I you know, I'm I'm, I'm paying attention to thirty matrix, and I'm like. Let me identify the four or five that I really need to pay attention to. Um, you know, I mean, how have you been able to manage that? Or do you have any recommendations there of, of how to identify the CEO of, of a company that wants to um, really go out there and grow? Um, like what matrix um, or, the, or those, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, lead measures, if you will, should you be paying attention to? Okay, that's what I mentioned uh Cash flow. So, it, cash flow is the, is the combination of understanding the the income statement and the, and the uh, uh, and the balance sheet because the the cash flow shows you how how you're spending your money, uh, and 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 so uh, uh, if if I think I looked on the web and I think there's about you know fifteen or twenty uh, uh, articles on on understanding cash flow. So you know just Google cash flow and 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 there will be there will be articles on there that you can read about how to to, um, to to create your own cash flow analysis because that will really help you if you can do your own cash flow projections that will that will also help you understand you know how you're spending your money because the only way you run out of bit run out of uh, go out of business is run out of cash yep yep so so when you've got you got that financial component to uh, to it right so you you you're, you're you're tracking that you're knowing your numbers there you're you're paying attention to that um, I don't know um, if you've read the book uh, the E Myth um, and I apologize if some of these questions might seem silly but I have I've, uh, I just have to ask you I've never never had the chance to. Um, pick the brain of somebody as successful as, as you. So, um, you know, inside the E myth, um, you know, Michael Gerber talks about, um, you know, so many people say that people are the most important part of, of, of a business. And he says in there that that's not necessarily true. It comes down to your systems and processes because you don't have those dialed in and buttoned up. People can never show you their greatness. And I mean, uh, you, you number one in your experience, I mean, how important are your systems and processes, um, you know, to, to your overall success and, and, and the company that you grew? Well, okay. So the systems and processes are the, 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 the heart of the company. In other words, that's, that's like uh, you know if you're a doctor and uh, and and you don't have any any equipment to measure how you're doing you know you know how the patient's doing how are you going to come up with a prognosis you're just going to you know like like trying to analyze something over the phone it's it's tough to do you know I mean I know there 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 are you know applications where you know you can call a doctor and you can you can kind of or you can go online and kind of Google your your symptoms and but 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 unless you have the ability to actually measure them yourself. That's the systems and the procedures that you're taught processes. Uh, you really, your company's not is not going to um, function well. But having said that, the, what good are the systems and the procedures if if your employees are unhappy or if you don't have, as you say, good health, employee health, as you would. So I talk about the employee health of the company is extremely important. Without good employees, you're not going to have happy customers. Or, or you're not going to have, you know, what good are your systems and processes going to be if you don't have a, a happy workforce? So, yeah. so the, you know, I had the lowest turnover in our industry. Um, and, and the reason we did is because we treated our employees as, in, as, as individuals, as, as, as not just numbers. These, these people we considered, you know, part and partial to the success of the company. You know, I don't know of a single um, uh, successful company that doesn't have successful employees. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, today you, you, you hear the word culture thrown around constantly, right? And, and, the, and, and just like you just talked about, I mean, the, the importance of culture inside your business, but it seems like, you know, so many people are looking out for all these outside sources uh, um, to bring in that culture instead of having the, the leader really lead that culture and the culture being an extension of that leader. Um, um, I mean, how did you go out there and create such an amazing culture? Okay, so um, I, I dealt with cultures in a, in a different way. I talk about the basic. What's a basic culture? Honesty, 
is number one. Integrity is number two, because integrity is doing what's right when no one's watching. And then dignity of every individual, respect, respect of people. That's extremely important. You know, to, in today's uh, political environment, you can see we've lost all respect for each other. And, and so in the company, we made sure that everybody was respect, treated with respect. I allowed no swearing. You could not use any vulgar language at all uh, at, 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 at my crowd. Um, and then the fourth is doing whatever it takes, no excuses, meaning you're willing to put forth whatever energy and effort it takes to, to, to help the company succeed. And that's extremely important uh, uh, because, you know, it's, it's a quid per quo. You know, if you, if you make a mistake, you should correct it and not put it on the company. And so I think that's another important thing is that, is that every uh, uh, entrepreneur or executive needs to, to make sure that his people understand that they're not to put the problem on the company. They're to solve the problem themselves. We're paying them to do a job. And it's not to make the company have to suffer, it's to make the company succeed. So if you get your people to understand that their part of that is to make sure that what, whatever their, their role is, that, that they don't put that problem on the company. Yeah, yep, love it. So then, um, you know, I, I, I know you've had, I mean, it, again, I mean, you, you've led your company profitably through eight downturns and, and, and have had so much success, but I know it hasn't all been easy. And I'm sure that there was, you know, I don't like the word failure necessarily, because I know those are our greatest learning experience that truly define us to the entrepreneurs that we are. But what were some of those, you know, um, greatest learning experiences or some of those, you know, a couple of the biggest obstacles that you had to overcome that really defined you um, to being that amazing leader and entrepreneur that you are. Well, I wrote the book about, it's called doing the tough things first. Uh, and so uh, I define discipline as doing what you don't like doing and doing it well. So I, I just learned to, to do things that other people just couldn't stand doing. Uh, and, and because they don't, they detest doing it, so they never learn to like the things they hate. And so, you know, whether it be exercising or whether it be, uh, you know, getting up early in the morning or, or whether it be taking the time to, to learn, understand the industry uh, or your business that you're in. Uh, uh, so every morning when I get up, the first thing I think about is, okay, what is it I don't want to do today? And that's the first thing I do. I go do that thing or those things that I don't want to do, get them out of the way, I become 20% more efficient because I don't have to think about, well, I got to get to that thing. I, Oh, I remember I got to do this thing. You know, I get all those things off my plate early in the morning. And, and so uh, if, whether it's writing in my, my book or my blog or my pie, I do all the things that I really don't like doing, by the way, I'm no different than anybody else. You know, probably 80% of what I do, I really don't like doing. I just got to learn to like it yeah. because if I, if I can learn to like the things I don't like, can you imagine, what we could accomplish, Josh, if we could learn to, to, to do things we don't like doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's that whole thing. You know, so many, so many people in our culture today are, are chasing happiness and, and it's like happiness doesn't equate to fulfillment. You know, I, I'm sure when you're running that marathon, putting your body through all that pain, you know, it's not always the happiest moment when you cross that finish line, man, is it fulfilling, you know? And, and like you said, you do those things that make you unhappy, but it creates so much internal fulfillment in the long term. Yeah, it's a, so it, it's, it's not the journey that, that you like, it's the destination you're looking for. So, you know, it, it's, it's like, I don't like dealing with problems. I'm, I'm, I'm no different than anybody else in that respect. But what I do enjoy is solving them. So, you know, how are you going to be able to, 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 to solve the problem if you don't work on that journey or if you don't, you know, deal with that problem, even though you don't enjoy it? You learn to love it. You learn to you learn to uh, to 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 get you know some satisfaction in in dealing with a problem if you're the kind of person that that will stick to it. Emerson says that which we persist in doing becomes easier. Not that the nature of the task changes, but our ability to perform it becomes easier. And so that's the key here is that you know you got to persist, persist, persist. You know, and and you know how many people have written you know whether it be Tom Peters or whoever has written about you know, don't give up, you know, you know, qu quitters never win. And so, you know, you just have to be diligent and, and, and dedicated to, 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 to really just tackling all those difficult tasks that, that are going to face you every day. We're all going to have difficulties, you know, here I've lived on this earth now almost 80 years. And, and I'll tell you, you know, 
<laughs> hardly a day goes by that, that I don't have to deal with a problem or a challenge. And, yeah. but I've learned to, I've learned to, to like it. I've learned to say, Hey, throw another one at me. You know, what, what difference does it make? You know, let's give me another one to, to, to work on. Cause I love solving problems. I don't like uh, dealing with them, but I like solving them. Yeah. Yeah. Now, were you, uh, were you, were you always, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if, uh, cause I know we all adapt and shift and change and, and, you know, but I mean, did you always have this kind of this drive and this discipline in you or, or was it once you got clarity on your vision that you, you just knew that this was the, the type of person that you needed to become and you just went to work at it? Uh, so I, you know, I, I was um, raised in a home with the, uh, I'm the oldest of 11 children. And so my uh, mother was a, you know, preeminent uh, uh, mother and homemaker uh, having to deal with 11 children. And, and so I had to carry my load. I mean, we didn't have any dishwashers in those days, except the physical hand ones you did. And I had, I, had, I didn't have all the tools and equipment that we fancy what we do today. And I had to learn to work. Uh, you know, I had chores I had to do. Uh, my dad was a farmer and a rancher, and and I, and I had to work on the ranch and, and, and learn to, to to do ugly, dirty tasks. Um, I, I remember pulling water for for the for the, for the ir irrigate the field at two o'clock in the morning, um, and and uh, and I was only like 14, 13 years old. Uh, so I learned really early the the you know the value of work. Now the millennials today they haven't learned that yet because they, they have all these tools are given and you know, uh, you know, they, they can Google anything they want. They don't have to dig for it. They don't have to study hard. They just say, Hey, uh, Google, you know, find me this, you know, and, and they, and they don't have to do much searching, but you know, I grew up in a different, a different era. I had to search. I had to dig. I had to understand. Um, you know, I, I didn't have somebody to tell me how to do something. I had to learn to do it myself. And so self-reliance is something that I learned at a very early age. Um, and, and, you know, I had a driver's license at 13 and, and, and I had a paper route at 12. Uh, and I just learned to work at a very early age. And that's, I just learned to work. I work, work, work. And, and, uh, and so as, as they kind of indicate, some of the millennials just haven't got that understanding of, of work. Um, you know, they, some of them are 27 and 30 years old, still living at home. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I tell you, I, when I went off to college, I'd left home. I mean, that was at age of 17 and, uh, I haven't been back since. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, I was on my own. My, I had 10 brothers and sisters. My parents couldn't afford to keep me. I had to go off and earn my own way. And, yeah. and so that's, that's the key. And I know it's going to be kind of difficult to convey that message that it just takes work, whether you're, you know, uh, a real estate uh, entrepreneur or whether you're going to be a semiconductor entrepreneur. And it's, it's all the same. Yeah. You know, I, I've, uh, you know, I, I, I try to attend um, a lot of leadership conferences, right? Just to, you know, I'm always trying to improve myself as a leader as I'm growing my companies. And you hear so many of these leadership quote unquote trainers that talk about millennials and they're like, oh, well, you know, millennials aren't lazy. They're just, you just got to find out what they're passionate about or create a, a better work space environment. I'm like, well, if you've got that hard work in, installed in you, like, I mean, I remember being a, a, a working at the hospital, cleaning stretchers and, I wasn't passionate about that, but I was always passionate about delivering my best work I could, you know? Exactly. And that's, a, you know, whether you're, whether you're cleaning the floor or, 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 or mopping the floor or, or cleaning the stretchers, you know, you just got to do the very best you can. And, and uh, that's, that's really what an entrepreneur is, as, as he's got to be the guy that, that, that cleans the stretchers or, you know, he'll, he's going to do stuff that other people don't want to do. And, yeah. uh, and, 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 if you have to provide them a fancy work environment and free meals and, and, and uh, a free exercise room and, and th that's not learning to work. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious what, um, what led to you getting inspired to write the book, you know, uh, you know, to, 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 you know, go out there. Cause I know that there's a lot that goes in the book and it's not like you're not, you know, already uh, busy, busy, busy. Um, like what, what inspired you to go out there and, and do that? Okay, good, good point. 
So in 1984, I, my company is now you know, six years old. I had a friend of mine say, saying, well, how do you start my Krell? I mean, you did it with, with, with your own money and, and no VCs. And in your industry, no one starts a company on their own. I mean, they, they, they always have to go out for venture money or, or some other uh, uh, similar uh, financial structure. And, and he said, you, got, you should write the story. You should, people need to hear how you did it. And, and so that was the first, that was in 1984. And, and we're talking, you know, 30 years later before I start writing the book. And, uh, and so, you know, just, I'd say probably 20 or 30 people have said, you need to put this in writing. You need to write a book about this. And, and that's why I'm talking to you today, Josh, is, is you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just so thrilled with helping, you know, new entrepreneurs to want to get, get going. And that's what, what, what Tough Things First is all about. It's really a textbook. Um, I just talked to, the, to one of the um, entrepreneur uh, professors at San Jose State University uh, uh, last week, and, uh, and she said that uh, she's going to make it required reading for all the entrepreneurs in her class is they're going to read my book because she says it's fantastic. It's, it's really a textbook yeah. on how to, how to run a, how to start and run a company. Yeah. And what I love about it is, I mean, it, it seems like everybody today is a quote unquote guru in writing books and you've, you've got all these, you know, authors that they, they've never done it. Right. I mean, maybe they've studied some people that have done it, but they, they don't really know what it truly takes in those moments. And, and, you know, I'm a big believer of you. You've got to study the right people. There's only so much time for us to, to self-develop. It's like, I, I want to study guys like you that have done it, that have built it, that have proven and created that success. And that's um, exactly why, that's exactly why I was told to write the book. <laughs> you, you, you just said you, you're, you're a perfect example of why I did it. I don't care to make any money on it. I, I'm wealthy enough. I don't need to make money on the book. I just want to help. I just want to help other people understand what it takes to run a company. And, and I'm not one who just learned it. I'm the one who did it. And I, you know, I don't know if anybody else has a record that I do uh, of 36 out of 37 years of profitability. I mean, profitable for 36 years. Uh, I mean, it, think about that. How many people can, can talk about that? Yep. Uh, I, don't, I don't know really of one. <laughs> I mean, outside of you, right? I mean, it's, it's non-existent. Um, well, that's, why, that's why I wrote the book. I mean, I, seriously, I don't care to make a dime on it. I, 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 I wrote it to help others. It, it's a, it, if I can help these new students that are coming out of school, uh, if I can help you or anyone else, that's my goal is, is I just want to, I, I've never been one who, who wanted to do it for myself. I, I didn't do it for me. I, I did it to help others. I'm not well known as a, as a writer. And so, you know, McGraw Hill wasn't particularly happy with, with the fact that here they had an unknown author they had to promote. Uh, and I said, well, I don't know how else to do it other than, all I can do is, is promote my own book. So I'm the one that's been out there promoting, you know, tough things first because McGraw Hill didn't really help me that much. Uh, and uh, they're, they're a well-known book publisher, but they didn't, they, they really weren't much help. Uh, so it's just been me out there promoting the book. Yeah, absolutely love it. So, and then those of you watching and listening, I don't, I don't. It doesn't matter where you're at with your iTunes or Stitcher or YouTube or the website. There's going to be a link right below um, where you can go pick up Ray's book, and we'll make it. Just click the link, and you'll be able to go get it. And um, if any of you are serious about business, it's a must read. You know, right? You, 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 you gotta, you gotta. Again, you gotta study the greats. You gotta study the doers, people that have been in the trenches, right? There's no smoke and mirrors, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's the truth, and and um, I love it. So. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm really curious about, because I mean, as you, as you continue to create all this success, it, it, it can get very difficult because you're, you're, you're pitched all these opportunities. And I can only imagine how many opportunities that you were always pitched. And even though they all may be great, you, you got to know what to say yes to and what to say no to. Exactly. And you can't get overextended. And, you know, what have you used as an internal gauge um, to, to know what to say yes to and no to? Okay, good, good, very good point. By the way, I get pitched once a week, so you know that's a that's a lot of pitches I gotta I gotta um, uh, understand and and go over. And I don't I, I can tell on the surface by asking a few questions whether or not I even want to pursue it. Um, you know, for example, I ask you know, uh, uh, do you understand the concept of loving the things you hate? And if they don't understand that, if they don't get that, I just say, well then maybe we shouldn't be discussing it any further because 
trying see if you think about it, loving the things you hate is not an easy thing to, to, to digest uh, because it doesn't sound right uh, it sounds like an oxymoron so I ask questions like that I ask like uh, you know what's what's the most difficult thing you've had to do in your life uh, um, or, or what do you think about how important are are your employees compared to your customers you know because some people say customers are number one and I say employees are number one yeah. because customers come number two because without your employees you're not gonna have customers so, you know, I ask them questions like that, that help me then determine whether or not I want to pursue uh, them any further. And also I ask them, you know, what, what is your time to market on, on your product? And if they're telling me, you know, well, five, seven years, then I'm, I, I probably won't, I'll probably pass on it, you know, uh, because the development time is too long. So again, you know, there's, there's some questions you, you can ask to, 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 to get down right to the nitty gritty of, as to whether or not you want to pursue a particular business. You can tell, by the way, just like you can when you interview an employee, whether or not they're focused on themselves. If, if, they, if they don't sound humble, if they don't sound uh, like, hey, you know, that, I, that I'm, I'm, I'm in it for my people or I'm in it for my customers or I'm in it for somebody else or my, I'm in it for my family, and then I'll probably pass on them. Because, it, you know, you can either be um, what we call a king or rich. A king is being able to define your own destiny. Rich, you know, you could be one of those uh, unicorns, you know. I mean, they just, they just want to get in and get out. You know, they, it's called flipping. Uh, mm -hmm. You know what that is in real estate. Flipping is, is really, you know, you're not really married to the business. You're just flipping houses. Uh, and so if you want to be rich, uh, then, of course, you're not necessarily going to control your own destiny because you can become rich if you hit the lottery, okay? But if you want to be king, meaning if you want to control your own destiny, that's the people I want to talk to. Yeah. Well, that's powerful. So, um, you know, with, 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 I mean, technology, the way that it is, right. I mean, I, I, and if those of you listening, you fact check me on this, I'm sure I have it somewhat wrong, but it, you know, I, I heard a stat recently that would like for every one year now, um, we're, we're the, the technology that exists expanding what was a hundred years. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, it's happening so quickly and, and, um, you know, if you were giving advice to, to you know, a, a brand new entrepreneur today, um, I mean, do you, do you think that, I guess, are the, are the fundamentals timeless or, or with the changing economy that's coming up, do people need to prepare themselves um, differently going into business uh, today with all these continued changes in technology? Well, Adam Smith wrote his book, Wealth of Nations. He wrote that book back in the 1700s. Uh, you can fact check me on that or 1800s. Anyway, that's one of the most famous books on, on, on business that there is. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and, and that's what, 200, over 200 years ago, uh, he wrote that book. So the fundamentals haven't changed. The fundamentals of running a company are the same. Uh, now, there are some nuances, like we talked about how fast technology is moving, uh, and, and so the product life today uh, is about five years. That's about the, what we call the, you know, the life of a product. Um, you know, maybe uh, uh, 60 or 70 years ago, uh, maybe the life of the product was like 10 to 20 years. So the, the life of the product is, is now shortening or, and narrowing quickly, which means your time to market has to narrow too, uh, because you, you have to get in, get in, get that, product developed and then get it into your customer's hands. And so that the ability, you know, to, to, to get that product into, into the customer's hands has to improve. You know, where that that's changing very, very rapidly, but that doesn't mean the fundamentals have changed. That just means that how, how quickly you have to be able to transition your product is, is what's important. Look at Twitter. Twitter is having to hang on with the skin of their teeth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they, they have, they have to figure out how they're going to rebrand themselves, you know, and then, and, and if the same thing is going to happen to Uber or to Lyft or any of those other unicorns, you know, they're going to have to figure it out what, you know, if, or GoPro. Another example is GoPro. GoPro, look how long, uh, how, what the lifespan of the GoPro was. Was it three years at the most? Um, and now they're struggling. What do, what do we do next, you know? Yeah. Apple's going to have the same problem right now. Apple is coming to the end of their life, of their, of their smartphone. They're, what are they going to do now? What now they're they're looking at ubiquitous autos and trying to figure out how are they going to you know get in an, an, an automobile manufacturing or in at least in partnering. Um, you know Tesla is uh, same same thing. I mean you're going to find all these guys are going to be facing very very short product lives, yeah. and uh, and it's going to get shorter and shorter. 
I would say that that maybe within the next 20 years, the product life will be less than a year. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it, it, it makes sense. I mean, when you, when you, you know, when I got into real estate and started my entrepreneurship journey, I was 23 years old and that was only 12 years ago. Right. And, but I look at it even then, like we, we didn't, YouTube didn't exist. Facebook didn't exist. You know, I mean, we weren't even using scanners really then. And that, that was 12 years ago, just to think of what that change has been. And, and I agree. I mean, it's, you know, but that comes back to what you're say, you were saying earlier. You've got to take that time to pay attention and, and watch those trends. And probably it, 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 more so now with, with, you know, the speed um, than ever. Exactly. So, you know, the fundamentals, though, Josh, have not changed. So understand that. What is changing is the time to market and the lifespan of a product. That is changing. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, they're, 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 it's just, it's the, the technology is, is changing so rapidly. I mean, I was on the phone last night with a, with a designer over on, on looking at a new speaker uh, microphone design uh, of a product that he wants me to get involved with him. Uh, and, and it's just amazing at the, at the materials and the technology that we have available to us now that they're just advancing so quickly that are allowing now us to do what we call um, IOT, which is Internet of Things, you know, these, these like Fitbit type, type products. I mean, you're, you're going you're gonna to find that, for example, uh, for health-wise, that, that you're, you're going to be able to monitor your health real time uh, and, and alarms will go off uh, at wherever you want that, that alarm to go off to, to, to tell people you got a problem. Uh, you know, we'll be able to save people's lives this way uh, because we can get them care quicker. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, we live in a wonderful time. I mean, you, you're, you're very fortunate. What are you, you're 35 or 33 or something? Yeah. 35. Uh, yep. 35. And, and you're, you're at the, you're just at the beginning of, of a revolution that, that, that this world has never seen before. And, and so, you know, the, the opportunities for entrepreneurship are so vast and so unbelievably plentiful that anybody that, that doesn't at least look at their own ability, their own, uh, uh, you know, capability of, of, of starting a company or, or developing a product, they're, they're missing out. I mean, there's nothing wrong with working for somebody else, by the way, because we are all entrepreneurs in that respect. But if you want to build your own company, do your own thing, you know, now's the time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. So, um, you know, th th this next question here, and I know we're getting uh, long on time here and I know, you know, you're a really, really busy man. So I want to respect your time, but I've, I want to, I just have to ask this question, right? Because I'm, you know, I, I've got three, um, kid, you know, young kids. I've got a daughter that's going to be going into fourth grade, a son going into second grade, and I've got a four-year-old. And, you know, kind of like you talked about with millennials of, you know, they're giving, given so many, so many, what is a piece of technology and, you know, obviously maybe, maybe some more, um, you know, different treatment um, um, from the, but with that being said, um, how do, what kind of advice would you give, you know, cause I'm, I'm trying to always level up in business, but of course as a father as well. Um, cause I, I mean, I, I want to be able to prepare my kids as well as I possibly can with the skill sets. Right. And, and with all of this that's out there today, I mean, what, I mean, what kind of recommendations would you have for young kids or, or for parents that have young kids in today's economy and today's technological kind of crazy speed world that we're in to prep our kids um, for the future workforce? Well, to the degree you can pull those earplugs out of their ear and keep them from, from being attached to their devices, that, that would help. Um, you know, when I was a kid, you know, we had to build our own models. You couldn't buy them finished like you can today. So learning to build, um, uh, working with your kids and building, maybe it's Legos or whatever, but building stuff and developing something uh, as opposed to just sitting there texting their friends. Um, uh, you know, you, you got to get, you got to get them out actually socializing, actually interfacing with others. Uh, you know, invite their friends over to the house and, and work with puzzles and things, you know, developing that their ability to think through and, and, and learn and understand uh, and, and socialize and, and, and interfacing with other people. That's, that's the key. Uh, and so the, what I worry about is we're, we're becoming so, you know, independent 
we're not independent, but so dependent on our on our on our media and our and our uh, devices that uh, we will we're going to lose that that ability to interface with others. At the age of twelve, it was about the uh, uh, work ethic. Okay, that I learned it at that age because uh, being the oldest of eleven, uh, I had to kind of go to work. I mean, I had to you know if I wanted to buy a bicycle, I had to go out and earn earn the money, and so um, I. I got a, a job as, as a delivering papers for the Los Angeles Examiner. And, uh, and so it's, I had to be up by four in the morning and I'm talking about 12 years of age. Okay. I'm up at four in the morning. I'm, um, going down to my, to, to the manager's garage where we, um, took the papers out of the big bundles and then we, we would have to t- pay, uh, 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 tie them, you know, in a, it, so the papers were, were, con- in, you know, connected and then we'd stuff it in our bags and we'd drive to the to the homes that we were responsible for and then we'd deliver them and uh, that took about two hours to to do all that and i had to have them done by six o'clock in the morning uh and then once a month i had to go collect for the paper route and i had to go to everybody's home and then collect the money which meant i had to they had to be home you know and i had to you know, or I had to go back and and that used to take about a couple hours to, to collect that money each month. And then I would have to then write a written report, itemizing, you know, what I collected, the amount of money I collected, and then turn it in. If it was any shortfall, it came out of my pay. And then if, if, if the papers were delivered properly, in other words, if I did it before six and they were nicely on the porch, then I got a tip. Okay. If I got a complaint, two complaints in a month, or if he had to deliver for me, I could lose my job. And, and so I learned the responsibility at that young age. And I delivered papers for five years until I was 17. Yep. Uh, and, and that really taught me about work ethic. Can you imagine today the kids having to get up at four in the morning? Yep. <laughs> or, their parents, or their parents even let them get up at four in the morning, get on their bikes and going out and, and delivering papers, you know? Uh, of course, we don't we don't do that anymore because we we have the internet. But I'm saying, but that's what I did, and I learned at, at a very young age the you know the responsibility of of, of ownership of doing the job correctly, uh, and that's that's kind of what what got me understanding the power of work ethic um, was at that age of twelve. Yeah, because it sounds to me, um, you know, like uh, like you, you know, you talked about an, uh, earlier in the interview of um, ha- having to work at a young age, and that was just what the family had to do. You know, everybody had to contribute and 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 that. And so it sounds like before this experience, I mean, you you, you were a hard worker, and you had that ingrained in you. But this experience kind of gave you that. You know, you've talked a lot about knowing your your finances and knowing those numbers, and 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 this this you know, taught you that combination of, Hey, here, here's how I go out there and hustle plus the financials and running the business. And I'm kind of curious at that age with the tips and different things. Um, like were, were you, were you thinking at, at the age of 12 of like strategy, you know, right. Hey, if I do this or, or whatever, I can get some extra tips and then apply this. And, you know, um, can you kind of, kind of share some of those? Yeah, because that's really where you, where you made the money was your tips. And so you, you, you learn what it took to become more successful by doing the, um, uh, the uh, special things of getting, make sure the paper is delivered uh, before six, make sure it was nicely on the porch, not ripped up and, and, uh, and, and, not, and not in the rain, you know, if it was going to be bad weather, you, you made sure they were put in a, in a plastic envelope. Uh, and, and you just did those things to make sure that you uh, 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 got the most value for your effort. Because there's two things that, that customers want, two things. They want quality and they want service. That's the two important things, quality and service. Your customers will love you if you have good quality and good service. They're gonna hate you if you don't. And so there's no, you can, you can charge whatever you want. Price is not the issue. It's quality and service. That's the issue, uh, Josh, you know, as far as customers are concerned. Think of your own situation. You know, it's, it's the kind of quality and service you give and your responsibility in, in providing for your family is quality and service. That's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, 
And, and if you think it like if, if we take it into our own lives and just think about our own lives experiences, you know, um, like if I go to a restaurant, I, I mean, maybe the food is amazing, but if, if the experience is bad or, you know, um, you know, whatever, it's like, I don't care how good the food is. I'd almost rather go to, you know, I mean, I want both. Um, but that customer service is so important that I'll, I'll take a little less food uh, um, quality of food. If the service is amazing, you know, and, and, um, yeah, the, the, those, I mean, I couldn't agree more with that. And it's, I mean, it's sad. I mean, do you feel that, um, uh, customer service has gotten worse over the years or is it just that we're able to have more exposure with the internet and see more ratings and reviews? Cause it just seems like, I don't know, there's just like such a decline in customer service. Like not a it focus. It, there, I mean, you, if you, if you have a problem with your, with your dish network or your, or, or your cable TV, uh, you're going to be talking to somebody from, from India or from, or from the Philippines. You can hardly even understand them. Uh, and it, it's just, you're ridiculous. I mean, I had a problem with my new Ford Explorer uh, with the garage door opener using that home length. You know, it, I, I, I have yet, it still doesn't work. You know, and, and I've been after the Ford dealership, you know, probably five times. You know, what are you guys going to do to, to, to fix this thing? Um, and, and, you, and if you talk to the, to the people at home length, they're, they're rude. Okay. Uh, and, and they're like, they don't even care. So, you know, I think it has, I think that uh, that service has, has suffered. Well, quality and service are, are very related, aren't they? You know, yeah. how, can, how can you separate quality and service? Uh, you know, it, you know, um, we were in Hawaii recently and, and uh, uh, ate at a very expensive restaurant, you know, they, you know, talk of the town and uh, over in Hilo, um, Hawaii. And the, 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 the service was okay, not great, but the food was terrible. You know, the, it was cold. It was not, it was, some of it was overcooked. Uh, and, and that j just, to me, just turned me up. I'll never go back there again. Uh, and yet it's one of the more popular uh, restaurants. I mean, there's a lot of people there and, and, and it looked like a popular place, but you know, as soon as I experienced that, well, the service was okay. I want to say the service wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't terrible, but the quality of the food was, was not good. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, it, they go together. I mean, I don't know how you could separate hardly quality and service because we tend to tie them together. Yep. Yep. No, I totally agree. And then when you're, when you're running such a, a, a an amazing company as, as you've, you know, ran over all these years and with, with customer service and quality um, being so important, you know, really, really ingrained in your core values as, as, as a leader and a, an organization. Um, how do you, cause you get to a point where you're so big and then you have to have like quality control measures in place, um, you know, just to make sure those things are happening. And, you know, I mean, how, how, do you, how would you recommend entrepreneurs do that, especially as they grow? I mean, do you have incentivizations and should you have um, pay structures based on, on reviews and ratings? On, on, you, it, can you just elaborate on some of the things that you guys did to deliver both those two so well? So once a week on Friday, starting at 1.30, uh, we had a, a, what we call a correlation meeting. So we called all the department heads would come in every Friday uh, at 1.30, and for an hour and a half to two, we would talk about issues. Um, quality would get up and talk about issues with quality. This would be the VP of quality. Uh, customer service would get up and talk about their is issues in, in, in customer service. And we had everybody there. There was a representative from all the organizations were there, and we all talked about the problems and, and asked for help and suggestions from everybody so that everybody understood everybody else's issues and how we could help each other. And I call it a correlation meeting. And, and we did that once a week at one thirty. Yeah. Well, and it sounds to me because it, cause it, if you, if you don't have that, then people are just pointing fingers, right? Because it's, it's, Oh, well, that's not our department. It's out of our control. They don't, they feel like they don't have a voice and you gave everybody that voice and that, that I hate that. I hate that. I, I hated that, that, that I hate that, that uh, silo effect, you know, where everybody has their own silos yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and they, and they protect their own silo. They're not looking at themselves as an organization together. Like there's no I in team, right? That, you know, we, we, we have to work together if we're going to be successful. And I emphasize that dramatically. And, and we did that. I was at that meeting every week um, on Friday. 
And, uh, and at the end of the meeting, uh, I would give a 15 to 20 minute pep talk, you know, just on some subject, I'd pick a subject. And then I'd ask one of my VPs you know, periodically for them to come up and, and learn to give these talks too. Uh, and, and so I've given thousands of talks, you know, 15, 20 minute type, type talk, uh, most, mostly motivational pep talk type, um, and things we had to do, things we had, where we had to improve. Yep. Awesome. So, um, you know, uh, uh, I find that a, a lot of, um, you know, extremely self-made successful people um, seem to have a, 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 a daily ritual or, or some type of a, a daily routine or, um, you know, and I know you're, you're, you're really into your health and fitness and, and different things like that. But do you, have, have you over the years um, followed some type of a daily routine, whether that's a little bit of, of daily reflection, um, journaling, or combined with your workout that you have felt has had a, a big impact on allowing you to become such an amazing leader? Well, again, um, it's all about a routine. And, uh, and I know a lot of people don't like routines because they think they become stodgy. But what I did in my routine was I would get up at uh, 5.30 every morning. Uh, I'd exercise for an hour, um, sit down and, and list out all the tasks that I had to do for the day, you know, figuring out which ones I really didn't want to do. And then I'd tackle those first and then go to work. And then tackle those tough ones, get those bad dudes out of the way, and uh, and then um, uh, the rest of the day was was fun. Yeah. And uh, and then I, I would come come home at a reasonable hour, uh, seven o'clock or so, uh, to eat with my family, and uh, maybe then make a few phone calls and take a few minutes to myself, need to do some reading or reflecting, and then uh, back and then to bed. By t I never went to bed after ten o'clock. Yeah. Never never went to bed. I made sure I got at least seven and a half hours of sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. So, um, and that was a routine. That was a routine. I mean, I would, and I do it to this very day. I, even though I'm retired, Josh, I do the same thing. I, every day is, is still the same for me. Yeah. I don't watch the boob tube or get involved in any other activities like that until after I eat dinner t tonight. For example, I will, I'll be working, uh, uh, until, uh, probably, uh, six o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. So then, um, you know, because it's, I, I know a lot of entrepreneurs that struggle with, because uh, it, it, it's easy to get caught up in the extremes. You know, you can, it's so easy to get sucked so heavily into your business that then you neglect your health or neglect your family. And then, you know, we've, we've seen it so many times where the, this entrepreneur has this big bank account, um, you know, but they don't know their family and they, they've lost those relationships. And, um, but I love that you said, hey, I was at home every single night at this time. To, to have that with my family. And um, I mean, can you, can you kind of elaborate on, on that a little bit uh, of the importance of that? Because when you reflect back, it's like success isn't just about the big company and the money. It's, it's about all those things in life that are important to us. Yeah, it's moderation. You know, if you, if you, if you have to work 16 hours a day, there's something wrong with your um, work, work ethic. Um, you should be able to, to, to get your work done within eight hours, maybe 10 hours um, every day. If, if you say you have to work Saturdays and Sundays, there's just something wrong with, with the way you're running your company or the way you're running your life. Uh, I never work weekends. Um, I, I, and I usually work no more than 10 hours a day on, on average. Um, uh, and, you know, it's, it's it, to be have time with your family is, is very important. The only reason you work is to provide for your family. There's no other reason for it. Uh, and, and so, you know, if you, if you work and, and provide, but you don't associate with your family, what, what, what value are you to that family other than just, you know, providing them a, a, a livelihood. So, you know, balance is important. You, you have to have time for yourself. You have time for your family and of course your work. Uh, and I, and I put them, uh, in the order of family, you know, uh, maybe personal and in work or we're working personal, how you want to do that, but family's first. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, I mean, you, you, like I know, cause I've got three, you know, three young kids as, as we talked about at home and, and my, my, you know, wife and, um, like I know if, if I'm not, if I'm neglecting my family, it's impossible for me to show up and my business is the best version of myself and be that great leader. Cause I have that internal guilt about that. And you know, it, it ends up impacting everything, you know, it just spills over. 
Well, I've been married for almost 56 years. Um, and, you know, um, my family is extremely important. I have 22 grandchildren and six great grandchildren. And, and so, you know, uh, my family is really what is important to me. Um, and, and if I neglect my family, I'm really neglect, ne- neglecting myself. I mean, I'm, I'm not being true to myself. Yeah. Yep, love it. And it well, it just sounds to me like you, you, you've well, the way that you ran your company, and the way that you ran your life is you've, you've, you got clarity, and you never lost clarity on your own core values, both in your business and in your life. That's correct. That, I mean, once you go down that slippery slope, you, you start developing habit, and that habit, if it's a bad habit, is very hard to break. Uh, and and so you know, what you don't want to have is regrets. Mm-hmm. Regrets are the worst thing in life that you can have. To avoid regrets is to correct those mistakes immediately, instantaneously. Don't let them become a habit because they're very hard to break, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, you, you know, in life we're just a result of our habits, right? Whether the good or bad, I mean, that's, that's what it becomes. Um, I'm curious of, you know, you've been such an amazing leader and such an amazing mentor to so many, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of, of people um, who, when you were starting out in this and, and creating all of this, I, I mean, who were some of, you know, mentors or, um, uh, you know, maybe just successful entrepreneurs or whomever that you followed, that you read as you were creating this, that really inspired you? Um, I liked, um, of course, I mentioned, uh, you know, um, Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, and then uh, John Galbraith, or Kim, was it, Gal- and then anyway, uh, Management by Objectives. Um, I, I, I enjoyed that, uh, that book. Um, and, you know, I, I really admired my mother. My mother was a school teacher, uh, but she spent full time raising her family of, of 11 children. And my mother had a very, very strong work ethic. You know, probably as strong a worth ethic as anybody that that, that, that I know. Um, I, I I would never see her really sitting down and and, and goofing off. She'd write in her journal, or she'd write letters to her children, um, or or she would um, be working on on some other project for the for the family, or doing you know either sewing or, or or doing you know laundry. But you know, my mother was a was a, a very very hard worker, uh, and and to this day. You know, I, I, back in my book, I, I, I kind of acknowledge my mother as, as being, you know, one of the, the great people in, in my life because I really learned from her discipline. And, and so, you know, the, of course, there are many great leaders that we've had, um, you know, through the, through the centuries, uh, you know, Abe Lincoln, George Washington. I mean, these are great presidents that we, we admire. Um, and, and, and we can just follow their role, follow their their, their leadership. Um, you know, uh, I like Mitt Romney. I think, uh, you know, the way he treats his family, the way he's, he's run his business, um, and, and how he's cared and, and gave of himself to this country. Um, I, I admire that. Um, uh, maybe you don't admire his politics, but, but I admire him as a person yeah. and, and what, what he's accomplished. Um, and, and really what I, who I admire are people who are just, just really genuinely good people people who are honest, who have high integrity, um, who um, treat people with dignity and respect. Uh, and um, those, are the, those are the ones that I admire. I mean, if, if you treat everybody with dignity and respect, irrespective of their, their, their calling in life, um, whether it be the janitor or whether it be the king, as you would, uh, if you treat everybody that, with, with, with kindness, gentleness, humility, respect, I, I, I admire them. They may not be the wealthy people, but they're the people that make things happen because they just cause a smile to come on your face. They, you're, those are the people you want to be around. Yep. Yep. Love it. So then, um, I, I, I hear, you know, I, I've, I hear and I've heard, you know, so many times and, and, and so many, you know, top men, you know, coaches and, and gurus and, and, you know, leaders talk about, um, about your, your close associations, right? And it's been said that you're an average of the five people that you spend most time with, you know, right? Um, like, you, like, hey, if, if I hang out with five people that lack those core values that you said, I'm going to be the sixth person that lacks those core values. Um, I mean, how, how have you held 
that to yourself? Like how, how have you um, managed those associations outside of your family when, when it comes to, you know, those friends and those close relationships as, as you were expanding and doing this, um, you know, to make sure that you were uh, uh, the result of those same five? Well, uh, I have a story that I, that I tell. Uh, back when I was, was younger, I used to fly radio-controlled airplanes. And the club that I flew with uh, were, were mediocre. They weren't necessarily, you know, the best, best guys, but they were good guys. And, and I'd go out and I'd fly with them. But I didn't, I didn't learn much. I didn't become any better than they were. Uh, then I been, uh, decided to go up and fly with another club up by Moffett Field uh, called the Pioneers. And, man, I was low man on the totem pole. I mean, I looked like, like crap. Uh, and, and, but I learned after watching them and, and, and just emulating what they did, I become better. And I didn't even want to go back with my old club anymore because I didn't want to slide backwards. Uh, I mean, same thing with tennis. You know, if you learn, if you play tennis, do you want to play tennis with, with people who are better than you? Or if you're going to bowl, bowl with people who are better than you. Don't just bowl or, or play tennis with people you can beat. You want to play with people you, that, that, that will beat you because that's how you become better. Uh, and don't be afraid to lose. This, this is why you lose a win by losing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Win by losing. And, and, and that's the key. You, you're not going to learn from somebody who's worse than you unless you want to learn to be worse. Yep. So, you know, you know, fly with eagles. Don't fly with sparrows. Yep. Yep. Love it. Love it. So, um, all right. So, you know, knowing everything that you know today, um, if you could go back when this whole t- entire journey started, if you could go back knowing everything you know now today and give yourself two pieces of advice, um, you know, that you, you feel would have, um, you know, dramatically uh, uh, fast forwarded the, the success that you've had in, in business and life and all of it. Um, uh, what would those two pieces of advice look like knowing what you know now today? Okay. Now I'm going to surprise you. I have no regrets. The reason is because if I have a regret, I change it instantaneously. If there's something that I should have done or could have done or would have done, I, I did it. I didn't just say, well, let me wait until I have this, this interview with Josh and then say, well, here's two things I wish I had done different. Yeah. I kept myself on the path. I didn't stray from the path. And then people say, gosh, you know, well, I've strayed. I've, I've, I've kind of gone off to, and into the weeds. So what do I do? I say, get back on the path. Don't get off the path. Don't have any regrets. If you have regrets, you just not lived your life correctly. And so, you know, if you, if you are off the path, you can get back on. You just have to be willing to put forth the sacrifice and effort to change, to get back on that road again. And so I really, if I had to do it over again, Josh, I, I honestly didn't change anything. I wouldn't, I, I didn't want to, I mean, I, I'd be lying to myself if I said, well, I wish I'd have done that because that's not who I am. Yep. If I see something I should have done, I did it. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. No, I, I, I mean, what I think what's so cool about that is because a, a lot of people, they get off that path um, and then they, they feel that they feel that regret. They feel that guilt set set in and they slowly start to let it self-sabotage them, you know, right. And, and, and instead of, Hey, I, I just being in reality, Hey, we're all human. Sometimes we fall off the path. Um, let me learn from this experience, improve and get back on that path. Um, I mean, was this also part of your, you know, you talked about your daily routine and, and, and yes. that solitude. Was this, you know, part of that reflection time? Yeah. So let's, so instead of talking about what I should have done or would have done or could have done, let's talk about what I did. Yeah. That is a good advice to those who are listening, who maybe are off the path. And that is learn to love the things you hate. Learn to do the tough things you don't like. Don't, don't procrastinate. Do it now. You know, this is, my advice is if you want to be successful, get back on the path by doing the tough things first, by just learning to love the things you hate. Have that disciplined life. Have that routine that keeps you on the path. You know, that's, if you notice, when you get these windy roads, you know, there's warning signs. They've got guardrails to protect you. Okay, you need those in your life. You have to have warning signs and guardrails to protect you. Don't let yourself go off the edge of the mountain. 
okay? Stay on the past. You know, don't say, well, let me see how close I can get to the edge. Let me see how far away I can stay from the edge. Okay, that's the key. The key is don't get yourself upside down because that's a lot more work to get back on the path than to stay on the path. Yep. 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 Love it. So, um, uh, I know you, you know, we, we, we talked about, we talked about your book. And again, those of you that are watching and listening, um, uh, there's going to be a, a link right below where you can go, uh, get Ray's book right away. Um, but then you, you also mentioned that you have a blog and, um, if our, if our listeners, um, um, want to go out there and just continue to follow you and, and I mean, what, where's, what, where's the blog? Where, where's the best places to be able to follow you? You can follow me on LinkedIn on Twitter and also on, um, on, on, uh, tough things first, which is my, my website, tough things Um, you know, we, we, we list all of the, the articles that I write, I write for Forbes and a number of other, um, um, uh, uh, magazines. Uh, and to, so it's, it's not hard to follow me, but the easiest way to track me is just to jump on my website, tough things It's the same name as my book. Uh, it's my motto. It's my mantra, you know, let's 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 do the tough things and uh and so i love that i mean if 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 i think about today you know what did i not want to do today was i had a plug gutter in my house i didn't want to go clean that darn thing out because i had to get a high ladder to go do it you know and i was a lot so i first thing i did was go, go get that ladder and haul it over here and climb up on the roof and get that gutter unplugged uh you know that was the very third first thing i did and and so that's the kind of things i talk about doing every day is get rid of those things that uh, that I would typically procrastinate if I weren't on the path by the way staying on the path means you don't procrastinate does that make sense yep 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 um uh with um how do I want to frame this um yeah, I mean, with, with doing those tough things first, right? So, um, and, and, you know, like Brian Tracy's Eat the Frog First and, you know, getting those yeah, things out of the way. Um, um, you know, um, yeah, because, it, I mean, we do, because it starts building up. It's like if, if it's that, so, so when it's those tough things, because um, a lot of people try to run from their fear and, and run from those things, like um, how, how do you how do you identify, you know, in, in your daily routine if – I mean, just, just to prioritize those tough things first, right? Um, you know, because a lot of people run from that fear, that kind of negative gut feeling when they're doing that. Because I'm sure that you got a lot of things that you have to do. How do, how do you make sure that you're getting those, those tough things first done? Well, you just ask yourself, you know, what, what is it you don't want to do? When I, when I lecture students at the university, you know, I ask them, I said, now, think right now how, what, what things you don't like doing, because I'm going to ask a few of you to tell me what those things are. And I'll point to someone and say, okay, what's your, what thing don't you like doing? They can do it instantly. I mean, they, they, they know instantly what they don't like to do. And so I said, well, those are the ones you want to tackle first. Yeah. Uh, for example, one kid said, I don't like getting up early. Okay, well, then what you're going to do is you're going to now get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Oh, no, no. I said, well, that's the way to train yourself or get up 5 or something. But, you know, if you're not getting up until 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning, you know, that, that's not a good habit. He said, well, I have to go to bed earlier. And I said, well, then go to bed earlier. You know, well, I don't want to go to bed early. Well, then if, you, if, if, you, if those things you don't want to do and you, and you won't do them, you're not going to learn. Yeah. So, you know, you have, to, you have to decide those things you don't want to do and then go do them. And then you learn to love them. You know, I can't think of a single thing I don't like to do, even though I would normally hate them. Yeah. Because I've learned to like those things that I don't like doing. Yeah. And that's really, that's really helped me, Josh. That's really helped me overcome a lot of, um, of issues. For example, um, as a kid, I didn't like making my bed, but I, I learned, I just said, okay, I'm going to start making my bed. And I made it just, just like the military. You can flip a quarter on it and it would bounce. You know I mean? I, I made that bed perfectly as a kid. And even to this day, I, I mean, I, I helped uh, make, make our bed this morning with, when I got up. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't leave it for my wife to do. Um, I cleared the table this morning after my breakfast. Um, you know, I put away my clothes. I don't leave my clothes laying around. I don't expect somebody to pick up after me. I, do, I pick up after myself. Um, you know, I polish my own shoes. Even though I can afford to have somebody do it, I do it because I want to train myself to do things which are menial. 
because if I can learn to pick up after myself, do those menial tasks, then I will respect others who have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so awesome. Cause it's like you said, Hey, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I can, I can delegate all this stuff out, but you, 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 you created a philosophy that you were going to live your life by. You created that internal agreement. And this is goes back to your core values where you, you just sounds like you just, you, you don't break those internal agreements to yourself. And, and it's still, it's still, you know, even though, you know, you, you sold your company and then you're doing all this, you're still living by those core values, which is just so amazing. Yeah. I, I watched my own car. Just again, to keep myself humble. I mean, I can afford it, easily afford to take it down to a car wash. But I just wash it myself. I want to learn to continue to do those things which everybody has to do. Not, and not just because I'm wealthy. Okay, I want to learn to do them because it keeps me, as you would, lower, you know, down. I don't, I don't puff myself up. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. So, um, I know that, I mean, gosh, with, with all the interviews and all the, the questions and, um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know if there's a, 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 a if, if this would necessarily apply to you, but I, I'm just curious. Cause I, cause again, I know you, you've done so many of these, um, but are there ever any questions when you're on a podcast like this, or you're, you're being interviewed, are there ever any questions that you wish people would ask you that you feel are very important for people to know that just seem to never get asked. Yes. For example, um, it's always uh, easier to keep an old customer than to go find a new one. That's when they don't seem to ask me about, you know, how do you keep, how do you keep a customer? Okay. You know, remember uh, uh, to keep a, a, an old customer is better than going, finding a new one. And, and that's, and that's, I think is an important thing for entrepreneurs to remember that, that I have very seldom get asked about that. Yeah. Um, another thing that, uh, that I think is important that I, that, that I never get asked about what you, you did ask me by the way, but, uh, uh, others have not. And that is having this routine, this ability to, to, you know, to get up early, to go to bed early, you know, as they say, early to bed, early to rise makes a man wealthy, healthy, and wise. And, and, and so I don't get asked about that. You did, but not, I would say very seldom am I asked about the routine. So um, remember, it's an easy rhyme. I've t- learned it from my mom. Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. You know, that's just a, a nursery rhyme that, that everybody should memorize. And another one that, uh, that, um, that I'm not asked about, but mainly because they don't really understand the scouting program, is that I had all my VPs memorize the scout oath. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. That's the scout, that's the scout um, uh, oath, and, and, and that's important. If Just think about that. If you could, on your honor, do your best to do your duty to God and your country and to obey the scout law, which is, you know, re- respectful, thrifty, kind, and all those, the, you know, the 10 or 12 of them, um, and then to help other people at all times, and then to keep yourself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. You know, morally straight is very important. And I'm very seldom I ask about how important is morality and, and being successful. It's, it's everything. Morality encompasses honesty and integrity and dignity of other people. That's part of morality. And, um, and, and, and just living an honest life, being honest to your spouse, you know, being honest to yourself, being honest to your employees. Um, that's, that I'm, I'm very seldom asked about that because it seems it's not important to executives to, to have a high uh, moral integrity. Yeah. Yeah. And you see so many companies, you know, they, they, they talk about it. They might have their, their pledge or their core values, um, you know, but it's not, it's not constantly reminded inside the organization and, and the leader isn't living that congruent life. It's almost just like we do these things because we feel that we need to do them. Um, you know, but you're that guy that led by example, right. And, and did that. So I love that. Um, um, hey, Josh. Josh, another thing that very seldom anybody asks me is about my wife. My wife is right here. Come here. 
why, why don't you ask something to, to, to my wife? Uh, and here's my beautiful wife. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm fine. Nice to meet you. Yeah. No. <clears throat> ask her a question. Um, so, okay. So, um, when, when, when you guys are, um, um, <clears throat> In the entrepreneur world and creating these businesses, because I mean, a question that I get all the time um, um, from entrepreneurs that are trying to build a company is, how do I get, um, you know, the, the buy-in from my family to be able to support that? Because it's like, you know, the, the saying behind every, you know, great man is, 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 is a great woman. And, and no, a better, a better woman. A better woman, you know, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so how, how do you, how do you, um, stay on the same page and stay in that support that, I mean, support each other with that. Um, cause I know when you guys are growing these and with the family and, and all of this, it's not always easy. No, it isn't easy. And, um, I think that the, the spouse, any entrepreneur spouse has got to understand that there is a certain amount of faith you have to have in your, in your husband that's doing this or, whether it's the wife that's the entrepreneur, the spouse has to be able to have faith in that individual and give them constant reinforcement on that. And I think that the entrepreneur himself needs to realize that there is a, he has to keep a balance between his work and his family and that there has to be some time spent with the family. Now, my husband made sure he was home in the evening to have dinner with us. And he had dinner, I mean, he had breakfast with the children in the morning. Um, those that hadn't already gone off to school, like we had high schoolers, you know, their time schedules were a little bit different. And so, but we tried to have as many uh, meals together as a family as we could. And then you had interaction. He always made sure that he had the weekends free too. He didn't spend all of his time working. And I think that's a key that... The entrepreneur has to realize that he does have a family and he should make that time for the weekend to be with his family as much as he can. And, uh, you know, so we worked together, we played together. Uh, we had um, on Monday nights, we'd have our family get together and we'd have what we call family home evening. And we talk about family problems and what we can do to help each other and to become a better uh, family. And so we did make sure that we did have that time together. And then you make sure you take vacation times together and maybe go away somewhere. Um, we were really fortunate that we had an airplane that uh, my husband and I are both pilots and we were able to fly the plane. So we would take time and fly our ch with our children to say the nut tree, which was up near Sacramento, which was a fun place for the kids to be able to go to. Uh, we took trips down to visit his family. Uh, I mean, there are different things that we would do that we made sure that the family had some time together. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of these entrepreneurs today are forgetting is that they do need to pay attention to their home life as well. Yeah. And mm -hmm. their spouse that should spouse should help well, around yeah. the house too. Yeah. And do, well, and do, I do yard I worked with the kids on Saturday. Oh yeah. I work. mean that was one of the things that we did on Saturday morning when there there was probably about a four hour block, you know, a lot of times that we would just spend time working in the yard together, whether it's trimming the trees, the shrubs, working in the we had a vegetable garden, we'd work in the vegetable garden, we and the kids would do weeding. Wash the cars was extremely important. We did that every Saturday, wash the cars. And that was a good opportunity for my husband to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one with the kids and just kind of quiz them about how their week went, what they were doing, what, what was coming up for the weekend. And one of the things for our family home evening, we always had a calendar that we would figure out what our schedule was for the week. You know, if there's any activities that the kids had, anything that we had coming up, so that we could coordinate everything too, so that we were all on the same page. Yeah. Well, thank you, mother. Okay. Yeah, no, no, yeah, it's very nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too. Well, I thought that would help add, Josh. I mean, if you want to add that into your 
Your yeah, that no, was amazing. I love it. Well, I, mean, I tell you, I mean, it is, um, I mean, it's a question that, that on the podcast from our listeners, um, we get daily, almost daily, right? Because it is, it's, it's like, Hey, I've got these big dreams, goals, and visions. I want to do this, but I can't get the support from my, you know, from my family and they don't know where to start, you know? Right. And, um, and what, what I love so much about you is again, I mean, we talked about this previously, but as well, but you're, 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 it is none of this is theory, right? I mean, these are things that you, that you've done that you've continued to do, even though you're, you're retired, you continue to do these things and you can, I mean, it's, I love it. I mean, you're just, you're just such an amazing example and, and um, inspiration. So it's, it's amazing. Um, I do want to ask though, because the, the first thing that you mentioned was um, nobody ever asked you about keeping old customers or not old customers, you know, the customers that you have, cause it's, 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 um, uh, it's, Easy, not easier, cheaper, uh, better to take care of them at a high level than always going out there and acquiring new customer. I mean, that's uh, just chasing that new business is, is so costly. And, you know, I know you talk so much about quality and good service, um, you know, and making those such a high importance. Is there any other things that you did um, that allowed you to be so successful about keeping those long-term relationships with your customers? Well, that's the, the, the key is, is maintaining those relationships. If, a lot of times what we do is we, we're so focused on getting new customers that we forget our old ones, okay? And, and they hate that. I mean, if your customers, if your old customers feel like being left out, you're going to lose them. They're going to they're gonna go off and find somebody because if you don't take care of your customers, somebody else will. And, and, and that's the key here is, is you take care of them so that others won't take care of them for you, you know? Uh, and, and, and I've talked to many, many business entrepreneurs and they – it's, it's really key for them to, to, to I, I tell them, to focus on, on, on keeping their old customers. Uh, and, um, um, you know, I have a, a, a friend here in town who runs a, 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 a vehicle, what do you call it, an all-terrain vehicle company, or uh, recreational vehicle, that's what it is. And, and he, uh, uh, I've told him, he's just starting out, he's new in the business, I says, it's better to hang on to your old customers than to go out there and find new ones because the, their, 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 the loyalty and the, and, and the support that they're going to give your business will help you uh, be successful. Because um, if you're out there just, just trying to grab new customers, then um, um, you're, you're going to forget your old ones. You're not going to, you're not going to um, be successful. Um, and I said, you know, have, have for example, uh, a little bottles of water around. And when they come in the store, just say here, can I get you a drink of water or, or a can of juice? You know, little things like that make make all the difference in the world. If you're a real estate agent, you know, have have some some uh, a little cooler in your car that you can you can give them a you know a, a bottle of water or, or a little can of juice or something uh, as you pick them up and take them to show them a you know a, a particular home. Um, and then uh, when when you after you've uh, taken them to the home and shown them the property, write a little thank you note. Just tell them, thank you for, for, for uh, going with me today to look at this property or that property or whatever. But always thank them. Praise, praise, praise. That's the biggest thing I see is, is, is in business is that we forget how to praise people. And, and uh, you know, if you can learn to say thank you and, and appreciate you and, and, and God bless you and all these other things, uh, those are the things that really matter to people. Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, the, 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 and it's, it's, I'm sure it's always been this way, but it, it just, I mean, at least to me, it just seems like it's gotten worse of um, that people just never feel appreciated um, and a lot of different aspects of their life. And I, I mean, I almost feel like it's easier today if you show that little appreciation for it to go so much further today, you know, than it's probably ever been in the past, you know, to be able to, to do that. Um, so I, I love it. So I know, know we've uh, covered so many, you know, amazing things and topics and you've give, given so much amazing advice. Is there any, as we wrap up here, is there any last pieces of advice or, or, or words that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Cause they're all here listening to this interview right now um, because they want to go out there and create the best life they can for themselves and their family. Do you have any last words of advice they'd like to leave them with? You know, I, I want them to know how much I appreciate them listening to this podcast. I really do. And for them to take the time to listen to the, to, to the details, you know, the good quality questions that you asked, um, just how uh, respectful you have been of me uh, in, in, this, um, in this interview. Um, I just want people to know that. I want people to know the quality of person that you are. 
the kind of, of, of care that, that you're putting into these interviews and the energy you're putting into it. Uh, people need to know that Josh Smith is, is, is a real person doing a great job and helping people become more successful. And they, didn't, they need to know that. Yeah, no, I truly appreciate that. That truly means a lot. Um, uh, and, and those that are watching and listening, I know I know I end every podcast with this, uh, but information without implementation is truly just the start of delusion. Information is no longer power. It's taking that information, taking action on it that, that creates that, that power inside our lives. And you know, Ray shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you um, that can highly and massively impact your life. Don't just listen without take action. Take action on something that you learned immediately and go out there and create that life that you know you want and deserve. And again, we're going to have links below to Ray's book, to Ray's website, to his blog. So make sure to go check that out. Um, and Ray, man, this, is, this has been such a massive honor. I, I know how busy you are, and this has been a massive honor having this show. I truly appreciate it. It's been an honor for me, though, Josh. You know, and just as a sequel to what you were saying about, you know, a plan without action is, 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 is worthless. Uh, knowledge without wisdom is just plain information. So, you know, when, when you gain knowledge, you know, use wisdom as you apply that knowledge, because that's all that wisdom is, is a proper application of knowledge. So, again, be wise in, in the decisions that you make using the knowledge that you have. Um, and that's and that's key. So I want to. You know, say from the bottom of my heart how much I appreciate the time you've taken, Josh, to to get this out to the to uh, you know your your listeners. Um, you have a wonderful um, organization podcast, and um, would invite your listeners to continue following you. Uh, you're doing a great service, and um, I just really appreciate the time that you have taken with me today. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And again, it truly means a lot. And and those of you watching and listening, thank you so much for being here, and uh, we will see you next time.